Good day, everyone. I'm George Eldred, one of the co-directors of Aspen Film, uh, and on behalf of our organization, we want to thank you for joining us here for uh, talk back with the filmmakers. And I also want to extend once again a very warm vote uh, of appreciation to the Red Onion, its staff and management for hosting us once again. And uh, I'd like to, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, uh, Dan Kleiman, uh, who is Chair uh, Emeritus and Professor uh, at, at Columbia University in their film department. And I'll let uh, Dan do the further introductions and get us going. Here we go. Okay, thank you, George. Um, we have, as you, if you can't hear, oh, I'm, Ah, now you can hear. Okay, well, that's tough break, but here we go. Um, those of you who are watching closely will observe that there's an empty chair here. We're saving that for an animator who is not yet here. Uh, but what we have here is Thais Dressenauer, Leron Riva, Lance Cody Williams. They're from three different films. Uh, the one thing they all have in common is they all are dramatic films in their way. They're story films. Uh, in fact, the animation is also, but right now it's an empty chair. Uh, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to please tell us what you did on your, the name of your film, what you did on the film, and briefly what it's about and what you're happiest about from your work on the film. Okay. Um, hello? No, I th is this on? Yes? Okay. Um, my name is Thais Rasinor. I'm uh, the director and co-writer of Memories of the Sea. And um, so what, what else? <laughs> uh, well, what, what's, what's it about? What's oh, yes. it about, roughly? Yes. Uh, so it's a story about, it's, it's a coming of age drama about a little boy who has to, um, get um, used to a new structure in his family and deal with grief and loss. And what are you happiest about from the film or from your work on it? Um, I say mainly um, the work with my actor, uh, with this little kid, it was his first film, uh, uh, it was his first work as an actor, so um, the process with him was amazing, it was really interesting to get him into character, and also the visual language that I achieved uh, for telling the story the way that I wanted to tell it. Liron. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, my name is Lee Rohn Reva. I uh, co-wrote, co-directed, and co-produced No Free Lunch, um, which takes place in urban Tel Aviv in Israel. But it doesn't really matter because it's, I think that the story is relatable in every urban setting. Um, and uh, basically what my film is about is uh, about a young woman who goes on a job interview. And that's what you're watching is a job interview. The only difference is, is that this woman is very underqualified and she uses her unique resources um, to uh, try to get the job. Um, and the thing that I'm satisfied most about with this film is that it is a job interview and it's very dialogue driven and I think that I was able to uh, circumvent the talking heads and uh, the feeling of it and, and actually capture the audience through to the end, which is uh, quite a feat, I think, for a 20 minute film. So. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> yes, I should say that film is playing tonight. No, uh, my film? Oh, Saturday. No, Saturday, Saturday night, 5.45. Yeah. Saturday at the 5.45 show. Lance. Hello, I'm uh, Lance Cody Williams. Um, I'm an actor um, in the film Spit, which is tonight, actually. It's a film about a hip-hop artist or an artist, his journey in finding the integrity of his work versus being marketable and kind of selling out and it follows his journey. I play a, a his manager, um, kind of the villain of, of the film. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and, and tremendously gracious to be here because I know that this is a filmmaker's um, genre and assembly, but to be one of the actors to be a part of this is an amazing 
experience. Um, and to the question, what was one of the the joys of being in the piece? I'm mostly a theatrical actor. I, I normally do stage, and this was my first film. Um, so the best part was seeing myself, finally seeing my work. Because I mean, you can see it on the monitors or see some of the things, but to actually capture um, some of the moments and to be able to see it was was a joy. Were you happy with what you saw? I, I laugh at it every time I see it. <laughs> I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> like every time I see it, it's just I'm like, and, uh, what? Wow, who is that? Um, yeah, to see what my instrument does. Good. There are directors who do not want their actors to see the rushes during a shoot. Well. Wow. I, I, it, it was totally point of view. We didn't have an opportunity to do anything but work in the middle of New York City, 45 minutes to get it done with a little budget. And um, we didn't have any takes. It was just straight monologue, straight looking into the camera. Action, let's go. So it was just really about the work. Right. How many takes? Four? Four. Oh, four, four. <laughs> The director is in the house oh, yeah. and, and oh, cool. is helping us out. It felt like uh, eight. Or something like that. Well, that, that's one shot. It's a point of view shot from the central character's point of view. So it's just you talking to the camera. Yes. How did that feel? And, and is, can you talk about the difference between doing a film and doing stage? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's not that much of a difference. Only the major difference was um, the work was was condensed because the process of the stage, you normally have a rehearsal period and you get to work with other actors and work with the director and you kind of feel your way out until you get into the audience and it's a longer process. Um, the film, especially in the way that we did it, was like a 30 second thing. So something that you would have like two weeks to do, you were given notes, um, you had to look at your given circumstances, and within 30 seconds, you had to hit a mark. So, I mean, that was the, the major difference of it. Um, to say what you mean, mean what you say, the basic acting 101 points are the same. It's just that it's condensed in a box. And, and the good thing about working with Ntume was um, he understood like what each actor could bring. And our rehearsal process was um, in the middle of Union Square. So he kind of got, got me used to working around people and not worrying about the things that were going on around me. Um, and he just directed me in a way where um, it was an intimacy that you felt safe with the camera that it wasn't something like he made it very obvious that the camera was the other character. So, I mean, it, it just felt, it felt in the midst of all the hustle and bustle that was going on. I mean, we even got ticket. I think somebody wanted to see our, um, came, it was like a, um, a little, a little, uh, cop, New York cop was like, let me see your, your vouchers. Let me see your permits, you know, while we're still shooting, you know what I mean? Right. But he made it very, very, um, easy to work with the camera. Uh, that's, the scene he's in is actually one shot. I timed it today. It's 80 seconds long, and you're talking nonstop. There's a lot of dialogue. Was that straight from the script, or was some of it ad lib? It, it, it's it's straight from the script. Um, there were some things that my mouth, me personally, it wasn't fitting my mouth. Um, yeah, we tweaked it a little bit. Because he, he said to be like a man of the streets and also one in the boardroom. So, I mean, the profanity, some of the profanity came from me. I was like, can I just say? <laughs> <laughs> you say fruit short skirts. Can I just say the word, please? <laughs> you know, but other than that, no, he, he, it, it, we, we kind of stuck to the blueprint, which was um, an amazing amount of work. Because at the time I was doing a play off Broadway, dating agents. And, you know, doing a lot of other stuff. So it was just like, bam. Okay. Well, I, I thought it was terrific work. Thank and you. you can see it tonight. Uh, it's the 530 show? The 830. 830. Okay. Uh, now, for the two directors who are here, and starting with Lerone, What's the germ of your, where did it start? Because uh, both of you are 
co-writers as well as the director. Yes. Um, I started out as an actress in high school in New York, uh, and I always loved the theater and, and acting in general, but eventually when I went to college, I decided I didn't want to be a waitress for the rest of my life. So I, uh, I went and studied geology. <laughs> And, uh, and then I moved to Israel, and geology and Israel don't go together. There's just no, no business there. Um, so I, I went into marketing uh, at an internet company, even though I had no experience, and I think you'll find that uh, very analogous to the film. Um, and after eight years of doing marketing and product management, I moved into the behind the scenes, you know, producing short films and uh, docudramas. And... Eventually, I decided to direct, and when I did that, I, I took a year study at Tel Aviv University and decided to like just experience it, see what editing's about, see what filming's about. And while I was studying, I I devised this story. I have a relationship with uh, with deception and lying. Um, when I was a rebel back in uh, high school, it's pretty much everything that came out of my mouth was unreal, and I'm quite the opposite now. There's nothing not honest that comes out of my mouth. And I just, I thought it would be interesting to, to create closure for myself and, and devise a story where, where every person has a relationship with, with lying and deception. Some people are completely unforgiving about it and some people believe that there is room for it when, um, when it's a matter of survival. Uh, so I just thought that would be an interesting twist um, to the... And then how did you work with your co-writer? Well, it took me three screenwriters to finally find, um, to finally find the fourth. <laughs> and uh, I went through, no one got me. And, and I, 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 it took me about a year to go through those screenwriters. And I finally settled on one who became a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, and we have decided to continue working together. And we're now co-writing a feature. So, um, well, I'm curious, because I've co-written a lot myself, I'm curious the dynamics. Did, did you always, were you always in the same room when you're writing together? Or did someone goes away and writes something and shows it to the other one? How, how did it Interesting. work? Interesting. Um, when I approached him, he was a friend of a friend, and that's how I, I met him. When I approached him, I came with a full treatment. I knew every single scene that was in there. It's just, I couldn't write in Hebrew. I don't write in Hebrew. So I needed a, a, a dialogist. Um, and he ended up being much more than that because it, it, it's, you need skill to be able to write a, a, a good movie, uh, especially a short one that's, that's concise and, and, and makes sense. Um, and so he really jacked up the conflict and the, and the, the things that were important to, to, to make notice. Um, and so I came with the treatment and he started writing and we just went back and forth for about six months until we had a final draft that we were really comfortable with. So it's basically he writes, sends something to you, you send it back. And I, and I send it back with my comments because I couldn't actually write anything myself. But um, yeah. That's very good. Uh, Thais, tell us, I have to confess, uh, I've known this woman for a while because she's in the school where I teach at Columbia. So tell us the germ of your story and how you found it and okay. how you developed it. So actually... Dan was a, a key part of the developing of this story. Um, uh, I'm currently going through the master's at Columbia University and we have this process that it's called the 8 to 12. <laughs> and basically what we do is uh, in, in our first screenwriting class, everybody writes a script, a short film script. And at the end of uh, that semester, we all, all the class puts it up in this sort of system server and we all get to read e each other's script and as directors we approach the person who wrote a script uh, that we're interested in and we pitch for them why are we interested in directing their script and how do we visualize it how do we ambition it and basically you you choose a partner well the writer picks you if uh, if the writer thinks that you're uh, um, What's the word? If you're suitable or like yes, uh, or competent, good, competent, appropriate. Uh, yeah, have a have a good uh, uh, vision for bringing their script to life. Uh, then they want to work with you, and that's 
that's how it happened. Uh, um, I read uh, my friend Sudarshan Suresh's script, uh, and I really got connected to it, to the story of this kid. And um, it was at the beginning, it was a the germ of the story is the same. It's this kid that has to deal with loss and realizes uh, uh, that um, that he's actually uh, carrying the rings for this new wedding of his mother. But the structure was very different uh, when uh, in its original form. So um, once Suarjan and I started working together, um, uh, we went through this class in the next semester that is called Script to Screen, where we take the script and we um, take it into a workshop, which Dan led. Um, and actually, you were our teacher in Screenwriting 1 when we were developing the script, and then you were our teacher in Script yes, to Screen. Yes. So he's been through the whole process with it, which is amazing, and it's so exciting to, uh, for him to see it here. Um, so in the Script to Screen, we're basically uh, restructuring the script uh, together, Sebastian and I. Uh, Basically, at that point, we were having meeting. We were going to the to the class, getting feedback, then having meetings and talking about the scenes. And then he would take a pass at it. And then at what point? Uh, at one point, when the class finished, we had this final talk, and I took it over and um, I restructure the the script in a way that we have this uh, slow reveal. And at the end. We are we're learning things about Fidel the same way he is realizing what's going on, and at the end we realize in the same time as he does that he is now carrying the rings for his mother's new wedding. Yes. Um. Mm -hmm. um, let me just add a couple of things. This is an exercise that's a requirement at Columbia. You must direct a film that you didn't write that starts out as somebody else's script. Uh, so it was, a, it was a requirement that she find somebody else's script and work with that person. Um, and it's called an 8 to 12 because the film is supposed to be eight, between 8 and 12 minutes long. How long is your film? 8 and 21 seconds. There you go. There you go. Um, now, I have a question. Well, I have a question for... George, are the animators here? No. Uh, Matume, would you like to come up and take this chair? And... <laughs> this is Matume Gant, and he directed the, the film that Lance is in called Spit. Uh, I find it interesting that in this film festival, there are films called Spit, Shock, Sweep, and Stop. I noticed that. <laughs> uh, this connection has been made. Uh, it's hard to know how that happened, but uh, because I'm about to ask a, a question aimed at the directors, so I'll include you, uh, which is tell us, in fact, I'll start with you. Tell us what the first shot was and why you chose that. The first shot that I ever shot, or the first no, shot of the film? The first shot uh, um, of the film. Well, the what? first shot of the film is is a a conversation between a father and his pretty kind of infantile son through the eyes of the of the child. You can't actually um, see the the face of the child. And um, the reason why I chose that uh, is, you know, my film is very much a kind of a traverse through this person's existence as he's trying to figure out why he's feeling the way he's feeling and why his life has kind of hit this wall. And I've been really interested in this idea of how much fear is implanted and how much fear do we get when we're like little children from our parents, things that we've inherited that we have no idea. And maybe that's why we're like, why can't I figure this out? Because it happened before a time before we were actually ever able to realize what actually happened. And I, I wanted to start that way. I wanted, to, I wanted to bring it back to a corner of more of a genesis um, because I felt that was important and because the film was very much about connection and, and you know loss of connection and do we still have connection. So I felt like that was the main thesis and I felt I wanted, it, it had to start there. 
And it's clear you planned that from the beginning. Yes, totally. I mean, yeah. When I when I when I wrote the script, that was the first thing that came. That was the it was literally the first image that I had. It's a little different. I actually had the son visually um, sitting in his lap and something, and then it felt better to be in kind of cohesive with the actual visual t- storytelling of the film to make it the full POV. So it's a POV through the bars of his crib mm-hmm. of the father. And it lasts, I think, two and a half minutes. Yeah. It's a long monologue. Yeah. I mean, I'm an actor by, by trade. I mean, I'm in the film, and, and I like empowering actors. I'm, I'm, my whole thought is to, you know, more acting, less editing. <laughs> more ca- camera, move the camera before I move my act, before I, you know, move the cut, you know. I'll move the camera. The, let's, let's put it in the actors. And I have, a, you know, Lance, I, I got amazing actors. I mean, I think these guys are incredible. So I was like, you know, some people told me not, not to do it. Actually, someone told me specifically, don't do that. That's the worst thing you're going to do. You're not going to get into anything doing that. I said, what if I have a great actor? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Lerone. Yes. Uh, your first shot. And, and why is it your first shot? Ah. Uh. My first shot starts on the toilet because her life is shit. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> and uh, she goes to change it. I mean, we all are familiar with the, uh, those that write scripts are familiar with the arc and the change that needs to occur with the with the actress, um, with the with the character. Uh, and I think that that's very. <coughs> Very poignant in uh, in the in the film where it starts on the toilet and it doesn't end there. <laughs> starts with her sitting on the toilet. Yes, yes, yes. Rehearsing. Rehearsing. Um, she's a self-taught. Uh, she's she's an autodidact, and uh, and that's how she does it. <laughs> she wakes up in the morning and studies her newspaper. <laughs> okay, Thais. Um Mine actually starts in the ocean and ends in the ocean, so it's uh, a closing of a circle. Uh, that first shot is a shot um, from the back. We don't really see the, the the face of Fidel, but we are seeing him against this big ocean, and that's his connection with his father. And and so we at the at first moment we don't understand what it is, but we just see this kid there sitting just thinking, not doing anything, alone with the ocean. And at the end, when he goes back, we realize why. Very nice. Well, let's extrapolate from that a little bit. How did you, and I'll start with you and go down the line. uh, How did you go about choosing the shots? Did, Did you work with your DP? Did you storyboard? How? What was that process? Um, so I, yeah, I storyboard. I, I draw my own uh, storyboards, and um, I work the shots myself. Um, I these images came to mind, and uh, and um, I found this visual language um, to tell the story in like a fragmented world sort of way uh, and I drew everything and once I got to because I developed this in New York and then I got to Brazil and we got this amazing uh, DP which uh, Michelle introduced to me Toca Se Abra he's wonderful and we got together there was a, a a really good energy between us and we sat down and we talked about my shots I show him everything and we read the script and he's like you know exactly what you want so it's gonna be easy to work this together because I feel like you have the movie in your head and he was great to like understanding exactly what I wanted and making it work with the space that we had and and the tools that we had um, yeah did you check the the shot before you did a take, did you look through the eyepiece? Uh, yes, always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my uh, director of photography I had worked with before, uh, his name is Frank Tiriano. It's funny, he actually used to be a student of mine. Uh, <laughs> it was funny, and he's a, he's a great, 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 gifted, young, 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 talented guy. And I, I sent him the script because I knew I wanted him to shoot it, and he got it immediately. And we had been you know, previously discussing, you know, working in this idea of, longer takes, longer shots, and, and you know, the c- camera movement and really following actors. So he just got it. And, you know, and we, we did a lot of, um, when we would do our scouting, 
we would uh, just, you know, talk about it and, you know, play with it a little bit and see what, see what we did. And then, and then on the day, you know, is, you know, set it up, check me and him both check it and we look and we, you know, for, for, for every shot, but we had a lot, I mean, a lot of discussions and a lot of talk about, it. but, but the main thing was following in the actor. I wanted him to really think about the camera as person, the camera as breathing. So I told him, I was like, you know, feel it. You're, you're, you're a character. Just feel it. Just move. You know, you're, you're breathing. And, and he got it, and you know he he understood it, and he's he's great, and, and it was, you know, and you know sometimes we had to like you know look back and be like all right that didn't really work that well let's let's figure this out you know but it was it was very fluid it was very fluid. Handheld mostly. Handheld, and we used we used we used a gimbal for certain shots, so some a lot of handheld, a lot of gimbal, and um, yeah, I th I think we probably never used sticks for the whole film. Yeah, yeah, ne never once. Um, wait a second. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so from the very beginning when I was writing the, the script, uh, I, I recognized that my character, with the character work, that there was a duality. And I think there's a duality in all of us. There's who you are when you're alone and who you are, what you look like from the outside. There's what your home looks like and what your office space looks like. There's um, poor versus rich. There's a plethora of dualities. And it was important for me to express that um, through film as well. And so in the film, you, you'll be able to see that in the exposition part where you see her at home, you, you get a sense of drab. Um, everything's dark. It feels like an unhappy home. And uh, once she comes outside, uh, there's light. And um, the use of the camera, was no you'll notice as well, in the, in the home, it's handheld. And, and, and it creates this like stress. And you just want to get the hell out of there. And in the cafe, where the interview takes place, you'll notice that everything is very stable. Um, and and it just, it's clean and it makes sense. And uh, you'll, you'll also see that you, you can sense that in the sense of color. Pink is very visible <laughs> because pink represents for her who she wants to be. She wants to be the, the high tech woman sitting in a cafe with her laptop, you know, um, feeling that, that, that power and, and at home it's, it's, it's quite the opposite. You can, you can see that she brings the pink into her own bedroom just because it reminds her where she wants to be. So we, we express that through film. Did you storyboard? Did you know your shots on the day? You'd come in and, and know what the shots would be? Yeah. Uh, we only had one day in each location. Um, one day outside, uh, one day in the apartment, and one day in the cafe. In the cafe, we had about 60 shots to do, uh, all in light. Um, and so we started at 6 in the morning. We had no choice but to know exactly what we were doing. And it was I'm a producer at heart, so I knew exactly the timing of everything. Uh, and it was important for me to, to get in there with the camera and the DP and just not waste time on the day and just work with the actors and focus on that. So yeah, I knew exactly. Uh, Matume, how many, how many days was your shoot? Four days, we did in four days. Um, multiple locations each day. I mean, the good thing about, you know, shooting longer takes, it does take you, on the day it's a little bit less. Like one of the, there's a big uh, sequence in, um, in the film that was really all one long shot. Actually, it's edited. It's actually all really one long shot. But, you know, that was also a two and a half hour to three hour rehearsal of coordinating and, and figuring out things and making sure everything is correct. Um, and we shot it, we shot it a few times in a couple, couple different ways. But um, we also, we, we, we'd have a lot of rehearsal too. You know, we had, we, you know, um, was like we, we had a practice camera and me and, and me and Frankie would go out and just, do practice certain things. We did, we did a, lot, a lot of rehearsal before we did it just to kind of feel comfortable. So when we went in on the day, we knew what we had to do as far as place and placement and things like that. So you you rehearsed with a camera? You, had, mm -hmm. you did footage that you yeah, we did. see we, if the we, shots yeah, were? Yeah, you know, we, we had, a, Frankie has like a, a, a Canon 5D. We just grabbed it. We just, you know, just played around, you know, and not we didn't necessarily get to work, work in all of the settings, but we used like similar settings just to kind of get an idea, kind of get a feel of what was happening, you right. know. 
and the shot that Lance was in, was that really 45 minutes to do that whole scene? Oh yeah, I mean, we were on a weird time crunch because I had to shoot another scene, and um, and Lance, I think he had to, he had to, he had to I had to, um, he had an audition to get to. And he was I in the had, middle of I had a, an agent. I was dating agents at the time. Yeah. I had an agent, and then I had an audition. Then I had that. Then I had a voiceover audition, and then I had a show that night. And the thing is, Lance was the only person who could do this role. Like it wasn't a thing where I, I had a well, I can get somebody else. I was like, no. <laughs> I need Lance to do this. So I knew I had this window of time and we just went in there and, 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 and got it done, you know, and, and I mean, my crew is just awesome. So I, I had a great crew and Lance is just awesome. Thank so I, I never had any disbelief we can get it done, you know, you know, and, and we met up and we met a few times beforehand to kind of get, so we, we knew where we were going to, going to be going. So, yeah. So he, he gave, he, we never rehearsed it. Not once, I don't think. We did it one time, but I and still... And you square the square about a week, week before that. Yeah. yeah, but I totally didn't know my lines. <laughs> you know, I was like, what? okay, I got it, I, I got it. I got but it worked, it, it helped. something told me, yeah. it was like, Lance, learn your lines, dog. <laughs> so, you know, no it was totally different. I, got, I live alone in the Bronx, you know, I'm up there drinking coffee, you know, with my PJs on, just throwing the lines out, like, yeah, I know it. Um, but but it, it let me know how I really, really need to know the blueprint backwards and forwards. Yeah. As an actor, that once you get on on the set, there's so many distractions, and it's a level of focus that you you never really think you have to have, but you have to have a level of focus you've never had before in your life. Um, it's totally different from the theater because it's an actor's medium. The theater, yup, I said it. Um, <laughs> I'm the last person to touch the work, so um, you know it's it's totally different. And then you just let it go because you never know what might what it might be. Did you know the whole script, or did you just yes. know your your part? No, I just knew my part. Yeah, I mean, I read the script. I knew where I, I where I was planted, but I was just totally into what my relationship was with that young man. Well, that's that's what you should have been into. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's good. Uh, Ty's talk. Wait, where were we? Have you talked about your DP? Yes. 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 Then we should move on to something else. We've been talking all all week about the fact that there are, there's the film you write, the film you shoot, the film you edit. And sometimes they're radically different, uh, sometimes not. So I have two questions about that. The first one is, was, was there a big difference among those three stages? Uh, well, you've already talked a little about the rewrites, but was there a big difference between what you came out with in the edit and what you went into with the script? Um, so for me, basically, uh, structure was was very similar. Uh, the script uh, to the shoot and then to the edit. The edit, um, the in the edit, I cut down. I I trimmed a little bit the scenes, even though I had envisioned it as a film that breathes and, and owns the silences and owns the quiet. Uh, it was still a little bit more silence, a little bit more quiet, so I, I, I trimmed it and kept, kept up the pace. But one main difference uh, that there was from the script that I did shoot and I didn't end up putting in the edit is a final line um, that the kid says at the end of the pier. Um, and uh, and once I I had it in my first cuts, uh, um, I got the feedback that we don't need it. We we're just there in that moment, and the line doesn't really close the story or anything. It also keeps it open, but just having his expression there and being there uh, alone in the ocean, um, we just didn't need that last line. And I think that that made it even stronger so okay that's yeah. good i i tried that line out on my wife this morning and she said you don't need it so, yes <laughs> uh, so i won't ask you what the line was okay. some some certainly people who don't know the film it would be meaningless anyway yeah. uh to me what is i had an interesting experience is that and i wrote my script and uh, I pretty much shot everything that I wrote. I maybe cut one scene right before the shooting. It, it just didn't, it didn't need it and proven it didn't need it. And I shot it. And then when I went to editing, I did my first edit. And my first edit was around 20 minutes. 
And I was like, this doesn't feel like my script. And then I, sh I shaved it down about four and a half minutes. And then I said, strangely enough, I've cut a lot of fat, but it feels like my script. And it was just an interesting experience. Um, I overwrote. Um, I, 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 put, I, I had too much in there. I had too much like tail and too much things lingering on, on, the, on the back end with the characters. And I realized that I, was, I had said it already. Why well, don't you see it again? You know, and it's like, it's, it's just cut it, you know, just go and move. And, um, and when I did that, it felt exactly like my script. My structure is the exact same. I didn't actually change anything structure wise. I kept it the exact same way. I mean, my film is nonlinear, so it, I just kept it the exact same structure. And um, I thought about changing things, but then I was like, no, why? And once I got there, it felt like my script. I was like, wow, this is interesting. It's shorter than my script, but it feels like my script. <laughs> Your own. Yeah, you keep, keep stepping on the back. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, same here. My structure stayed the same. Uh, my approach to, the, to making the film was a little... was surprising to me. I, I didn't feel like I needed it to be mine. Like, I'm the director, you guys do what I tell you to do. I, 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 I love the film industry because of the teamwork. I, I think it's a team team thing. In fact, there's a, a saying that's gonna, that, that, I, that keeps sticking with me. If the film is really good, the whole team gets the credit. If it sucks, then it's the director's fault. Um, I get that. I get that. But, and, and, and I think that the film is good because of the teamwork involved. And you can see that. I, I, I just talked throughout the process. I talked to everybody about the entire film. I'd ask people to read it. And the ultimate goal was to make a good movie, not to make my movie necessarily. I wanted to make something that would, that would talk to, to people. Um, and even one day before we started shooting, we had a production meeting with the assistant director and the, the DP. And I said to them, OK, so we're done with shooting. But I feel like we're missing something. We're missing something at the end that will just, you know, just make it work. And, and I wanted to talk to you guys about it. Do you think that there's something that, that can be added to it? And they all kind of sat around and were like, oh, okay, next. You know, like they just completely disregarded it. But at the very end, the assistant director came up to me and said, wouldn't it be awesome if she just like ripped the tag off? the jacket <laughs> kind of thing. And um, I hope I didn't ruin anything, but it, I think it made all the difference. And I think that it wouldn't have been as good a movie if it wasn't for me opening up and asking people to, to put their two cents. I don't think that one person can just be a god and decide that's what's right for the film. I think that, I think that if it needs to relate to everybody, then everybody needs to put their two cents into it. Well, you've given it away. The this is a movie about a woman and her jacket, and <laughs> is she going to keep the tag or not? Uh, and now you know. Uh, well, uh, let's stick with you because I'm going to ask a, another question of everybody, and then I'll ask for questions from the audience. But you've started in on this. What is your community? Do you have friends, filmmakers? that you show work to, and, and who are they? That, what do you mean by show work to? Well, During show the scripts process, or, um, or cuts or anything, just to get feedback. Or, or, do you feel you're part of a, of a community? Um, I do. In, in Tel Aviv, it's, it's shocking how many people are involved in the film industry, especially considering that it's really kind of impossible to make a living. <laughs> um, there, aren't, there just isn't enough money in, in Israel to fund um, films. But people are passionate about it. And it was, I've been working as a producer for the past five, six years. And almost every project that I work on, I become very good friends with at least one or two of the people in the, in the team. And so I had a, a, a nice support system and, and a trusting one. Mm -hmm. Trusting one in the sense that I, I let them read the script that I was happy with, and they told me not to make the film. Um, I have to thank my husband for the the push of the push to actually make it because at, at one point when you ha when you hear enough times don't make the film, uh, you think that maybe they're onto something because there's just so much work. I mean, are you going to kill yourself over a film that's not going to work? But 
I did believe in myself, and I did, I did know that there was something. They just didn't see what I was seeing. And, and, uh, and my husband just said, you are working on this. You want to make it. Do it. And, and it was what I needed to just go home and, and do so it. So you had a community that you trusted, and they told you the wrong thing. Um, it, it's, it wasn't necessarily the wrong thing. It was... It, it, they just lacked the vision that I had, yeah. so yeah. it's not their fault. The, the script that can't necessarily relate everything that they're going to experience the, when they actually see the film. One of the most, I think, one of the most important qualities a filmmaker needs is the ability to separate good advice from bad, uh, because you're always going to get both on any project. It was my first uh, film, though, so I was kind of nervous, but I'm I'm so glad that I went forward with it. It's been an amazing experience. Dume, you want to talk to community? You know, my community was the people who were in the film. You know, my producer. I mean, the first thing I did when I wrote the script, I sent it to my producer and, um, and her husband, who's also a very good friend of mine. And they immediately gave me feedback. And the guy who did my score, um, Scott, I sent it to Scott. And I sent it to everybody who I knew was going to be in the film or I wanted to be a, a part of the film. And I was like, please give me notes. And even with Lance, you know, like there was one Lance, uh, one line in the in in, in his uh, his dialogue that he was just like, I, I I I don't this line is not working for me. So I was like, cool man, let's let's figure it out, let's make it work for you, you know, let's 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 get the right line and end up being one of the funnier <laughs> funnier parts of the monologue. And that so that's what I would do with feedback. Um, when it came to cutting, I probably was not as open with it as I as I probably will be in the future. Um, Mainly also because of timing, and I was just working. I was getting it together, trying to trying to get it, get it, get it, get it together. But you know, I, I, I but then you know, I did have the people who were working on. Like my my uh, composer came in and he watched it. He gave his gave his thoughts, and my producer watched it one time. She gave her thoughts. So I keep a. I don't like to have kind of similar to what you're saying. I don't like to have a. I'm the Iron Fist director. You know, like, no. I mean, I have a vision. And but I want it to feel open. I want people people to feel like they're bringing their creative creativity to the project. So if that's part of you saying, "Hey, man, you know, what about this part?" Yeah, please, please. I may say no, <laughs> but you know, I want people to feel like they have that that that, that ability. Um, other filmmakers, yeah, it's funny. I, it's been growing since I've made this film. I've been, I've had the. I mean, being here has been great. And I, I had my premiere screening two weeks ago at, at BAM, and I've been able to meet other filmmakers and talk about about my work. So going forward, I'm very excited at the community that I've that I've that I've that I've that I've grown, and now I can begin to share when I'm hey, I have this idea. Check this out, you know, and see what happens. Very nice. Um, well, same here. Uh, um, a lot of feedback and notes from my team, my producer Michelle, who's sitting right there. Um, uh, the writer we worked together, and then also, as I explained, uh, taking it into these classes and hearing my peers' feedback. Uh, that's what's great about studying at, at a program like Columbia because you make a community of peers that are all interested in seeing your work and giving you feedback, and you also see their work, and you, and it's you know a, a reciprocity that 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 feels so so warm because you feel so safe for to expose your 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 work and and get honest opinions sometimes as you say some opinions will not work some opinions will work you as a director need to know what to take and what to not take you need to listen to what's not working mainly instead of necessarily listen to a solution but just see okay people are having trouble with this moment how can i find a solution myself too uh so yeah, um, it, it, it's nice uh, the the community in Colombia because it's not only the people that are in your year, but I mean it's an exchange from people that have already graduated and people that are older and um, and everybody feels strong about uh, helping each other out. So yeah, and 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 as you said, I'm excited also. This is the first. Uh, this is a world premiere, and I'm meeting all these other filmmakers here, and I'm excited to now start sharing with with the friends that I'm making here. So yeah, that's an excellent testimonial to this festival. But right. it's a great festival. I, I just um, wanted to just yeah. to reiterate a little bit about. Is it okay we talk yeah, about yeah, that? Yeah. Um, M2 May because I was he had sent me a link to um the monologue that I did. Like he was just like, Hey Lance, here's a little bit of your work. 
because I've never seen it on TV, on you know, on film. He said, here's a little piece of your work. Um, you can show it to your agents. And we didn't really finish it. So he was just like, you know, just be mindful. Don't put it on Facebook. Like, hey, y'all, I'm an actor now. <laughs> I'm on Facebook. Um, and I had sent it over to a friend um, who's been a wonderful, when you talk about community, who has been a wonderful patron of the arts in Baltimore um, that lives here in um, and happens to be a patron of the arts here. And um, she has been someone who I, I've known ever since I was 16 years old. And every time I do something, I'm excited to be like, hey, look, look, this is what I've done. And um, I had sent it over to her, and she was like, well, do you guys have a finished product? And now, I don't really know that much about film. I'll only act like I will. So I had asked Ntume, and Ntume was like, yeah, we do have a finished product. And some way, it was some emails being sent, and then we submitted the film, and that's how we got here through, like, just being open enough to share your work, like, something as small as being like, look, this is something that we got. We're proud of it. And, um, of course, the work speak for itself, because um, once you guys saw it, you had us come over. So that, that within itself, we think about, like, how things happen for a reason. You know what I mean? So we were just grateful to be here. Audience, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Describe the cameras that you used, any financial challenges that you had, and I'll throw in if you, f if you feel like telling us what your budget was, go ahead. Um, sure, uh, we shot with a 5D. Um, we shot with a 5D. Uh, yes, I can in fact be. Uh, well, yeah, there were a lot of financial challenges. We had a, a, a actually part of the program, uh, part of, part of the um, assignment in in the masters is to to stick to a budget, and and help us learn uh, as independent filmmakers how to make our resources work and be creative about finding our resources. So, uh, for that, I also have to thank my producer because he moved uh, heaven and hell in Rio de Janeiro to get uh, everything that we that we got to, sh to shoot that film. Uh, we pulled a lot of favors and we just found an amazing community there that was, that loved the art and, w and, and were willing to work with us as a team because of the love for film and the love for the story. Um, so yeah. We shot on a red scarlet uh, with a Canon lens. We used the same lens for the whole thing. Didn't, didn't change, we wanted to keep a consistency. Um, financial challenges, it was interesting because when we were, we, uh, we did an Indiegogo campaign for the film and I realized like, you know, I was like, well, this is going to get the film shot. This is not going to get the film colored, edited, you know, sound design, any of that. So there was always kind of this like little pressure, you know, like once I had this, but I kept going back to my community. Um, so whenever time there was a challenge, I was able to go back to my community uh, at large, friends and via social media and to get money, so it was never. It never really felt. It felt like a challenge. It felt like that for maybe thirty seconds. But I got, I got donated space. People really reached out in New York City to help me get this project done, and so it was. It was never really a terrible challenge. But you know, we shot it. We shot the film for about six grand, and then edited it for an, and then everything else for another like two to th like about three grand. You know, so people, you know, cut down their rates and really, really helped out because they believed in the project. You know, you know, I sent to my sound designer. He was like, all right, how much do you have? This is great. You know, so that's what you want to hear. Yeah, exactly. Rather than I'll do it if you give me this much, which means like he don't really like it. <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> uh, I used a DSLR. Um, I independently funded this film. It was important for me to make it, and so I decided to take the same amount of money it would cost to go and get my MBA and put it in this movie. This was my my schooling, uh, and so as a, I, I I've been producing uh, student and short films for about five or six years, and in Israel there's this culture of can you do me a favor and volunteer and kill yourself for it, you know, and, and work 15 hours a day and just, and not get compensated in any way. And, and one of my main goals in this film was to pay everybody what they should be paid and just 
have everybody feel like they are getting compensated for for their work. And I'm I think I'm good enough a producer to, to be able to figure out how much it's going to cost me and stick with it. And I'm, I'm happy to say that I didn't have to, to, to spend any more um, at the end, you know, like usually you have to like, oh no, I need another 10,000. But um, it ended up costing me $10,000 to make this film because I paid the actors and I paid my entire crew, which ended up being about 20 to... 20 to 25 people involved in the in the film and I paid the locations and I just did it right you know I, I didn't want any favors I wanted it I wanted it to be a, a professional project and and that's why that's what I got and I'm, I'm really happy with that outcome very nice very nice any other questions please yes sir How do you how do you go about choosing your locations? Is that a fair fair phrase? Um, sure. Uh, so we shot we developed the script as I said in New York, and we shot it in down in Brazil. Uh, so we got there. We originally had thought that we would shoot it in this uh, little uh, beach town um, that is called Bucios. But once we got there, we realized that. It wasn't really what we what we were looking for, and we also didn't have the resources to get all the crew there. So then we started uh, location scouting around Rio. I didn't want it to be Rio itself because Rio is a big city, and I wanted it to be a fishing uh, village, a small village that feels like time doesn't pass by. Uh, so we scouted a lot. We went around and we found this this little town called uh, Pedra da Guarachiva. Uh, that it's 40 minutes away from Rio. And we went there um, very diligently, Michelle, every day to talk to the people around there and uh, try to get um, a location, a house, or a house there to, to make the production be more efficient. We actually didn't end up uh, getting a house in that town. So what we had to do... but. I was already in love with the town, so I wanted to shoot there. We had to, to pick a house somewhere else. Uh, we were uh, uh, lucky enough that uh, Michelle's good friends had a big house that we could completely turn around and make it look like a small fishing village house, and that's what we did. Uh, so we divided the production in three days. Uh, the day in the town, in the fishing village, uh, where the pier is and all the little boats and everything, all the outsides. Then another day in this house, um, which we completely uh, reconstructed with uh, the help of this talented production designer, Paolo Satamini, who worked with us. And, um, and then the third day, which is um, the church, uh, we shot in this beautiful church from the... 1600s I believe is like the fourth oldest church in Rio de Janeiro and that was amazing to get also kudos to, to Michelle who went and wait for the priest every day uh, to talk to him in person like they, they don't take emails or calls no you have to go and talk to the priest and wait until he wakes up from his nap and like try to you know uh, make an approach uh, but but yeah once we got to meet him and he learned about the project he he was also in love with the story and wanted to help us so they gave us a, a the, this amazing church for a day um, and once I saw it, it was right in front of the ocean. It just felt perfect. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit, it's a mix of what you have in mind. And then once you get there, what you can find. And once you find it, how do you uh, also um, ambition your story getting shot there? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, when I wrote the script, I had like certain location ideas, but they changed as I began to think about what was feasible. And also, you know, I spent a lot of time with my DP on it, you know, and he had an idea. Like, one sequence which takes place on a rooftop, initially I went on the street. But he's like, no, you should put it on the rooftop. And he told me why, camera-wise. And I was like, I agree with you. So, you know, I, I let that be kind of fluid. But I always made sure I, I made sure my DP would come with me to every location scouting time so I could know that he would be comfortable where it was working. He felt he would have enough room to move, things would work. Uh, we did have one location nightmare, though. There's a club sequence in my film, and I was supposed to do it at a club. I had booked it about a month before. I did, the, I did the good thing. I booked it. And then about a week before the shoot, they just wouldn't answer my phone calls. And I'm like, okay, 
you know, so I'm, I give it to my producer. I was like, could you, could you handle this? I'm like, you know, she's like, okay. And she's very good at like, not like, you know, telling me things at the right, at the right time. So I'm like, Kachita, how's that going? She goes, we'll talk in about an hour. Cause she knows I couldn't deal with it right in this moment. And then she says to me in a, in a, a meeting the night before our first day, she goes, so they haven't called me back. We have to find another space. And I had three days to find another club. And I was, so after every shoot day, I'm scrambling, she's scrambling, she's scrambling. And a friend of mine had a space that he knew about. He called them and they, they, uh, it was within our budget. And, you know, we were able to use it. Funny, that same club did call us the night before and said, oh, yeah, you can use it. We were like, no, 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 no. We're not going to use it. The, the, the vibes there are, are not good, you know. But, yeah, it, it fluid, being fluid, being open, understanding that, like, you know, you write, sometimes you write something and then you go, well, that, that's not really the best place to do it, you know. And I let, it's where, where the feedback comes in, you know, and, and stuff like that. Or, like, you know, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, for me, um, I... I worked with a producer, I co-produced with him, and I, I gave him the task of being the location manager. And he made my life really easy. He, he brought me two options for each location that I needed. I needed an apartment and I needed the, the cafe. Um, I told him in advance uh, what I needed. Um, I needed a really dirty, crappy apartment so I didn't have to do too much art. <laughs> and I needed a cafe that would, would where I could clear out the customers and, and, uh, and work because you can't you, you just can't film when when the cafe is working. So, luckily, he was a waiter at the cafe where I uh, <laughs> where I filmed, and they were closed on Saturdays. And they gave me a great price, and I was able to be there from morning until eve, and um, and it worked really well. So that was that was nice. So right after I saw the places and gave my okay, I brought my DP over, and he gave his approval, and it was just. At least, you know, that was easy. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting thought. If you need a cafe to be closed, go to Israel on Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> There's a problem with that. Uh, luckily, they weren't a kosher cafe because oh. if they were kosher, we wouldn't be able to work there. Right. Um, and so they were just, you know, lazy. They don't like to work on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, let me just, the question to Thais is, what was it like working on someone else's script and what did you learn from that process? Um, it was an amazing experience actually, to be able to, to direct somebody else's story and bring it to life, especially at this point of my career where I'm just starting and, and usually uh, you're, you're directing what you write, and this is a great opportunity to, to come into a project that way. I did have a lot of input. Uh, Sarshan was completely open with me and uh, willing to collaborate, and that's why we chose each other. So uh, from the original story, we did a lot of different rewrites, and, and we got it to a point where I felt that, um, that I could see it on the screen, and... Um, so that's why we also restructured the narrative of the story and also adapted it to Brazil. And I wanted to shoot in Brazil because I lived there um, in uh, my years of childhood and I connected to that place and that moment of my life with the story that was happening. So what we adapted it uh, to happen in Brazil and we were there for the time of the World Cup. So we also uh, uh, sliced in a little bit of like what was happening in 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 Brazil at that moment. Um, so that was also really fun to do. And, um, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to, to have a story and, and, and just come as, as, a, um, as a director and see how the themes connect to you. And from that point on, uh, uh, start envisioning how the script will come into life because it's different from the process of just, uh, uh, starting a, a story yourself and writing it as um, 
once you're writing, you're already envisioning things. So when you're writing your own script that you know you're going to direct some things, you already write in, in the form that you're seeing it. So it is a different process, and it's also really interesting. All right. I, we're short on time. I'll take one more question. The question is, for everyone, what keeps you going? What makes you tell stories? What, what lights your fire? I would think caffeine, but that's, go ahead. Um, proper representation of African-American people on screen. Sweet. Yeah. Um, diverse representation of us, you know, not two-dimensional new stuff. That's, that, that, that stokes my fire. That gets me excited. And the fact that I can get in there and do that, I mean, yeah, I mean that's pretty much it. And, and then, of course, other th there's other things in there, but that's the main goal, especially with cinema for me. You know, I can get out there and really contribute to getting some good, creative, and diverse images of us that I don't really think we see enough in film. Uh, for me, it's um, it's. It's therapy, <laughs> honestly. I do. I, I. When I think about ideas and stories, they relate to me, and they're they're from my life. And 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 the work is so invested that you can't help but come to conclusions that that help you develop and uh, and self improve. Uh, and so, I'm, I'm working on a feature now, uh, and and it's doing exactly that thing for me. Um, where it just it, it makes you ask yourself the hardest questions because because when when something's not real on screen it's it's felt and so it's really important that 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 what's on on screen is honest and and there's work involved in that so that's that's what fuels me Lance do you want to answer that question Sure um and it's so funny cuz people say actor <laughs> and that could be tagged with so much but as an artist um, I can't plant my art. It's a verb and it moves. And being someone on where what I use is uh, how I feel, my emotions, um, my experiences, my library of, of experiences, it's always growing and it's always moving. So I'm one of the really crazy actors at Hazard that, you know, this is what I do. It's my passion, it's my life force. The work has been an anchor in my life that in times when everything else was just crumbling around me, the one thing that I knew I had solid, that I knew that I was convinced that I was put on this earth to do was the work. So, and even now, like now, and it's always moving and growing. And so just that, I, I probably would be lost <laughs> or just a crazy person that would, you can just put a script in his hand, so yeah. Ties. Um, for me, it's being able to to give some something to the audience that they're gonna be able to connect with and feel for uh, uh, the same way that I that I listen to a song when I'm sad and I'm like I just wanna listen to the song because the song is giving me something that I that I can connect and it's something that you you cannot explain but is you feel carried by the artist you're like he's got me and um, and I think it's wonderful to be able to do that, to provide that for 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 people to be able to see and feel and connect. Um, I like telling very specific stories about uh, very specific people. This kid in Brazil, in this fishing village, uh, but at the same time, it's so universal. Uh, the themes that I touch, uh, that I hope everybody can relate to it. Um, so yeah. Well, I'll just say one of the things that lights my fire is meeting people like these people and seeing their work. I, I come here every year because their selection is so great. And thank you all very much for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.